Hello and welcome to the podcast, 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn, Wisdom for the Next Generation. Here you'll receive wisdom, not just information or mere fact, and it's for an international audience of rising leaders. My name is Duff Watkins and I'm your host. This podcast is sponsored by the Professional Development Forum, which helps young professionals of any age accelerate their performance in the modern workplace. Here you will receive practical, honest, sound advice that you can't find in a workbook because it took us half a century to learn this stuff. Today's guest is John Colley, author, writer, screenwriter, and former doctor. John has written three novels, medical thrillers, has one nonfiction. I've counted 19 produced screenplays. Just getting one is quite an accomplishment. And um, for example, uh, Master and Commander was nominated for an Oscar. Happy Feet won an Oscar. I haven't seen Hotel Mumbai in its entirety yet, but he's written Mad Max and everybody in the world has seen that. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, no, sorry. I should correct you on Mad Max. I, I mean, in a way, I did, uh, did write Mad Max in that George Miller, uh, my good pal, had storyboarded the whole film and at one point just needed somebody to put it into words. Um, but really, it was written by George and his art department and his collaborators there. So I, uh, my my um, my contribution to Mad Max was uh, completely minimal. Yeah, but uh, yes, um, uh, either kind of written or co-written quite a number of screenplays now. Well, it seems to me you must be one of the world's greatest collaborators, from what I can tell, because uh, that's uh, and we're going to come to that, I suppose. But I know. Okay, you don't know this. I first saw you, I think it was 98, 99. I was sitting in an audience. You had just come to Australia. You were a doctor. I know you're edu educated at University of Edinburgh. You were um, a doctor in the UK, um, also in Sri Lanka, Madagascar, the Solomon Islands. It's like you're on a cruise, John. You're just going from island to island, <laughs> practicing medicine. For like, this is what it sounds like. Well, I, you know, I, good I, Australia. I got into medicine because it seemed like a good way to have adventures. And that was kind of a, my primary intent when I studied medicine. And so medicine for adventure. Yeah, yeah. So I immediately head out, headed off and started working in aid organizations and also had always had an interest in writing. So the writing and the medicine went on in parallel for some years. And the problem with that strategy, because uh, we were talking earlier about how we're both quite impetuous people, the problem with that strategy is that and unless you kind of accumulate academic qualifications, then you find yourself in this kind of weird medical backwater. So by the time I was 40, I was uh, highly experienced in dealing with bush medicine you know basically where you had a backpack and sort of 30 drugs in it and that was about it you know but the sophisticated modern medicine that was being uh, practiced back home was kind of a foreign country to me and so it was quite easy for me then to kind of bail out of medicine and uh, and into writing full time because frankly i felt unqualified as a doctor by then i kind of i came back when our kids were born and uh, and uh, and really, you know, worked in a high tech hospital in London for six months and realized that uh, I was kind of uh, sort of um, had that style of medicine. Mm -hmm. Both, both kind of practically and philosophically, I kind of parted company with that style of medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, you um, you said at the time, just 98, 99, that you had, um, now, yeah, I mean, you're married. You had three kids, I believe, at the time. Um, I thought you were in Singapore, but I knew it was an island up there somewhere. And you decided to move to Australia, your wife's Australian, yeah. and reinvent yourself. And you came here and, as you say, a bit lucky, but I'm sure a lot of effort went into it and wrote a little movie called Master and Commander starring Russell Crowe, which was nominated for an Oscar. Not bad. That's good. That's not bad going for your first. Uh... Now, but you had been a writer for a long time. You wrote a medical column for the UK newspaper, The Observer, which is a newspaper of some renown. So it's not you weren't a novice at this. No, and I'd written novels and uh, started off writing novels quite early. And, you know, I mean, you, you always forget all the stuff that ends up in your bottom drawer, which is like your attempts, you know? I mean, one of the life, life lessons, I'm not sure if it's on our list is, you just keep, you just gotta keep, keep on swimming as they say in the movie, you just keep on going at the thing that you're passionate about. And finally, mm -hmm. you'll find some kind of breakthrough. The breakthrough might uh, be, I'm not really supposed to be doing this, I'm going to move into something else. But the breakthrough for me was, I wrote these novels, I, I, and they did pretty well. They were published by Penguin. But the 
loneliness of the long distance novel writer was something I really didn't like. I liked being a novelist, but I actually mm-hmm. the process of writing novels, whereas writing movies, as you said at the beginning, is a much more collaborative um, endeavor, working hand in hand with directors and producers and actors. And that's where I kind of find my sort of comfort zone, I think. Yeah. Clearly. Do you, do you, let me ask you, the, this is our first standard question. Do you remember your first business or career lesson? Yeah, no. Uh, well, w- w- should we go with what I've got on the list here, uh, Duff? Because I'm sure. kind of, because uh, this is really about children, you know, and, uh, and we're coming at this like, uh, um, uh, you know, I'm now 60, my kids have kind of, uh, 65, my kids have grown up, the eldest is um, 26 and the youngest is 20. Um, I remember when they were young, and this is now making me kind of think back to my own earliest days. You know, you see on the wall behind me, this is my COVID project, is learning learning scales on the saxophone, you know. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do I wish I'd learned when I was like a little tiny kid? And I see my, my young friends now who've got new children and they're wondering which school should I send them to? And my advice to all of them is, Send them to a local school because in five years' time, you're going to want them to be able to run around their friends' houses and get involved in a community. As Hillary Clinton says, it takes a village to, to raise a child. That kind of open-door community, which actually we have in our neighborhood here, has been a constant joy to us and such a, such a boon when you're raising children because you do need the advice and counsel and, uh, of other parents. We all feel we're in the trenches when you're a young parent. So having that kind of, having children who all go to the same school, the school's just around the corner and they all get to know each other. And these friendships, like my school friendships, sustain you through Mm -hmm. life. You know, I mean, my children have got friends who they made in nursery school and I do as well, actually. So I think that's an important thing. And and again, you fret about, oh, what what do my children need to learn in order to get to a year, sort of whatever it is, and get into senior school and get a good step on the ladder and actually... The only things I think it's really important to learn when you're young are music and languages. And, and uh, to that end, when our kids were small, we went to live in France for a year and they're all, well, the girls are kind of bilingual in French now. So uh, that was a real boon as well. It struck me then that children will soak up language. Like it's like, you don't actually have to teach them. If they're in, a, if they're in an area where they're exposed to language, they'll soak that up. And weirdly the same with music. So. Um, yeah, that was my first life lesson. Yeah. You can learn anything when you're very small, learn learn music and languages. Yeah, this is the first, if it's it's not an education without music and language. And um, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, some things about you just keep swimming towards something and, you, and yeah. the lesson might be you realize that it's not your thing. I've got three guitars in there, John, you know, that, uh, that uh, I never open anymore. <laughs> because I, I, th- I think I have the reality, I've confronted the reality that music is not in my destiny, but but appreciate our playing it but appreciating it's still there the other thing that music teaches you and i think this is really important both as an adult and as a child is it's like you know all we have is incremental learning and um i play the saxophone like every day for 20 minutes and that 20 minutes is incremental and so i'm 20 minutes better every day and that <laughs> lesson mm-hmm. goes like you know we had a guy who built a stone wall in our garden here he was a ex-alcoholic whose who's way of staying sober was to do stone masonry. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be out there, rain and shine, Lex, I love him to death. He's just such a great guy. But Lex would come and he spent all day shaping a stone and put it in the wall. He'd go away and come the next morning, rain or shine, shape another stone. And over three months, this wall emerged. And you go, my God, Lex, I mean, how did you make that thing of beauty, this curving wall around the clifftop? And, uh, and it was like every day he showed up he made his one brick. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's how you write a novel. That's how you write a screenplay. You kind of, you one brick at a time. You just keep mm. on. And your comment about language resonates with me too. My wife is Brazilian and she complains that her English has not improved since being with me because I speak it so poorly. <laughs> and um, uh, <laughs> when I try to speak Portuguese, she says, speak English, just speak, you know, it's, it's you know. <laughs> However, so, but the ability to communicate in another language, and that could be language, could be images through writing, music, of course, uh, but an, uh, there's just nothing quite like that. Sure. But you and I, you and I try to 
uh, learn Chinese now, we'd, we'd be laboring at it for years. But if you take a six-year-old to China, put them in a Chinese school, or even keep them in Australia and put them in a Chinese school, they'll be fluent in a year or two. And it's like, it's a miracle, you know, they just soak it up, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, we spent a lot of time on question one. You know? That's all right. That's right. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, before I get to the next lesson, is there anything that you have unlearned lately? And by that, I mean something you absolutely positively knew to be true then, but now realize not the case. Let me think about that and come back to it, Duff, because it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. I'm sure you, there are things. Uh, they say as you get older that you, um, you learn to forget that's actually that's part of um how your brain improves with age i mean older people they say are generally happier because they've decided to stop worrying about a lot of stuff and there was a kind of magical thing that my medical consultants used to do i remember going around the wards with these older guys who'd seen a lot of different diseases but could recognize patterns you know and they could almost stand at the end of someone's bed who you spent as a young doctor, you spent an hour, an hour and a half taking a detailed history and examining this person and trying to work everything out. And they would stand at the bed and almost without any information would spot it immediately. Mm -hmm. That is kind of, that's the kind of magical thing that comes with, uh, with kind of pattern recognition and the sort of algorithms that your brain starts to learn. Mm -hmm. with and medical diagnosis and novel writing and, and constructing stories, which is what I do now, you kind of, um, you, you spot immediately the problem with something, you go, it's not that, so it must be this. If it's not that, it must be this. And you go through this little branching kind of thing, okay, that's the kind of story it is, or that's the kind of patient it is, or that's the disease it is. So I think in general, the art of learning to ignore stuff that's not important is, uh, is something that is uh, really important to cultivate. Because as you know, if you're kind of, if you're, you're paying attention to everything you're paying attention to nothing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and neuroscientifically there's a lot of evidence to support that yeah 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 all right um lesson number two the reason we have two sexes when we're staying with education here for yeah, the yeah. moment so i went to a, a very traditional old boys uh single sex school and the, and the um and uh i came out of that school highly educated, you know, got good final degrees, went to medical school, but ignorant in one <clears throat> really important respect, which is that I knew nothing at all about women, you know, and, and seeing my... As opposed to now, John, is what you're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> when you have wives and daughters, you kind of like, it gets deep into you. So, um, I look at my children who went to a, a kind of co-educational schools and uh, at least in their early years and they grew up with friends of both sexes with whom they were completely at home and they were completely at home with them before sex became a thing you know like in their pre-pubertal years and they they just rubbed along with boys and girls and then they they grew up together they changed together so i'm like a total believer now in co-educational schooling and again this is kind of a lesson for later in life but i think sending your kids to a co-educational school Okay, now, now the thing is, yeah, I agree with you completely. Yeah. However, my sister does not. Right. And she is, was, she's retired now. She's a, a teacher in North Carolina. And she said to me many years ago that she wanted to send her daughter to a private or, or a women's college. And I disagreed with this vehemently. And, and I said, for the very reasons you just articulated, she said, and I don't have a reply to this. She said, girls, self-esteem and self-image is so fragile that if you send them to, that it that actually needs a place to uh, blossom and bloom um, without uh, what the pollution of boys, I guess. Now, you're, that's you're, what- I did, I did say that the girls learn better in single set schools, but you know, I mean, year nine girls are, can be really cruel to each other. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, I question the premise myself, but. <laughs> yeah. um, I think uh, having the other sex present, this works even in adulthood, it, it kind of civilizes you. Mm -hmm. And it was striking to me, um, coming out of this all-male 
environment. It was a day school, so of course we had we knew girls outside the school, but actually we didn't live with them in that kind of way where you get used to them, firstly as people and secondly as objects of desire. You know, like if you mm-hmm, go to all mm-hmm. boys school, you come out of that thinking of all girls as objects of desire. It's bizarre, you know. You kind of it takes you your university years to to appreciate them as friends. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so. And, you know, we talk about education. So, you know, you've got to learn your maths, you've got to learn English, you've got to learn um, history. But actually learning your place in a egalitarian, multicultural society is such an important thing. And it's a thing that we neglect when we put our children, not just into single sex schools, but also into these schools. I mean, private, wealthy private schools tend to be very monocultural. You know, you don't tend to get a great array of different kinds of people in them and um, that's that's then then kind of limits you because you're in this kind of ghetto of people like yourself for a long while afterwards and there you know I mean this has been said before but there are politicians in Britain who've lived in a kind of you know they go to Eton and then Oxford and then Mm -hmm. and then uh, you know Whitehall and they kind of they're never outside that sort of Male dominated Anglo environment, you know, and their actual experience of life is very limited. Lesson number three how to succeed before you start before university. You so, uh, look, this might just be specific to my university, but I went to this <laughs> rather kind of you know, traditional uh, medical university uh, in Edinburgh. Um, I had actually one great advantage of that place because I, I got an exemption from subject in my first year and I could study anything I liked and so I studied fine art and um, and that was just such a just to kind of because uh, again you get you start off down these tram lines and in the case of medicine back then it was six years in one subject you know constant sort of being, having science drummed in future so to have an art subject um, that I could sort of learn about and then refer back to and actually a group of friends who were all in the arts faculty was just that was so great um, but the way medicine was taught then, and it's quite different now, but the way it was taught then was, was that you progress through these different faculties, you know, so you'd start off, you'd do anatomy and biochemistry and pathology, da di da you know, and finally, after three years of all these different uh, specialities, you know, in kind of in the science of medicine, then finally you'd get to see a patient. Um, and they wrote the textbooks uh, back then where all of these faculties would get to give you their version of the textbook. And of course, the bacteriologists, so it's, all, it's all about bacteriology and the, the pathologists, it's all about pathology. So you'd get this massive information thrust at you. It was only by the time I got to sixth year and I discovered a really slim volume, the Oxford Handbook of Medicine that had just been published then. It was like kind of, you know, 500 pages long and it had here's everything you need to know for your final exams, you know? And I've been learning these reams of stuff that was, you know, kind of <laughs> been forced on me by these specialists and these subspecialities, you know? If I'd had that book at the beginning of the course, I could have actually sailed through it, you know, because I'd know what the end point was, you know? So I, I think, you know, and this is true of uh, my kids going to university, you go into these courses where everyone will be throwing information at you from every side and, and you really need to look at the final exam papers and say, what is the point of this course? What is the core information that I need to know at the end of it? And then you start to can then you can kind of attach things onto that. Well, to know this, I need to understand that. To know that, I need to understand this. But what is the end point? And that's actually, you know, a lot of my work as a screenwriter is rewriting other people's scripts. And mm-hmm. that, that process of like, what is this actual story? Condense this hundred page script down into five page storyline right out of the beats of the story here's here's the story that in the end we want people to understand and know and feel and focus on that and then everything that is important to that story will hang off it rather than you know when you're a young screenwriter or a young novelist you just you imagine you just throw everything in and it'll somehow shape itself you've got to start with the shape start with the destination yeah didn't i think uh, was it you who said that in a seminar where if you're writing a screenplay, write the final act or the climax uh, first, know where the destination is um, so that you're able to? 
Sure, I don't always do that, but certainly knowing in a screenplay, knowing what the theme of this is, you know, so I'll tell you a story about this now, I'll tell you the story of Anna Jones, you know, um, and, uh, you know, we can talk about all the detail of the adventures that he goes through, but finally, what is this story about? And, and the interesting thing with films is that often the final scene of the film encapsulates what's the story about. So in a good film, you go to the final scene. And this is Indiana Jones, who was a Tomb Raider, a non-spiritual, unattached, uh, sort of casual with women, didn't believe in God. He ends up tied to a pole, seeing the reality of the spiritual world demonstrated to him as these ghosts come out and kill all the Nazis. You know, so. That is the point of Indiana Jones, really. That's the theme of the film and the, the emotion of recognition, the emotion of revelation that you get in that movie. Of course, it's an exciting thrill ride. It's a joy ride along the way. But the reason it's emotionally impactful is because it reminds you that spirituality is a real thing. You know? and, and what you've watched, whether or not you recognize the time, is a guy moving from a place of uh, completely kind of buccaneering, pragmatic adventurer to a place of understanding this kind of spiritual bond between him and Marion and the spiritual bond between him and the art. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. And, uh, and the, the nature of film writing is that these thematic, the thematic message of the film is always buried in a really complicated plot that entertains you and absorbs you and takes you from step to step to step. But, but the real, the, the real essence of the film is in that theme. And so that's finally what you try to get to when you're, when you're telling a story. What's the theme of this story? Does that apply to a person's um, career? Yeah, what is the theme of this career? I think it probably does in that, uh, you know, we all tell ourselves a story about our lives, which, and there's a, there's a whole form of psychotherapy, I don't know if you know this stuff, but which is narrative psychotherapy, where people come to you confused and, and, uh, and lost. Where have I been? Where am I going? I had an abused childhood. I had a this, and you know, I was kind of passed from pillar to post. I kind of never knew, I never had friends. I was a little betrayed. Da, da, da. They tell you a sad story. And your job as a therapist is to say, well, here's how that is a hopeful story, you know. And, and we all do that with our own lives. You know, you, mm -hmm. you kind of, you, you take out, you sort of try to take out the stuff that is just noise and focus on the thing that is a continual thread that will take you somewhere hopeful in the future. That's what you're trying to do when you're writing a novel or writing a, a film. And I think it's also what we're all trying to do when we narrate the adventure of our own lives and put it into a form that will give us somewhere to go, mm -hmm. afterwards, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so if I was to narrate the adventure of my life, it's this guy who grew up, went into science, whose early years were dominated by this scientific process, who always had this kind of siren call of intuitive, imaginative thinking, um, could never quite put these things together, finally gave up medicine to be completely in the world of uh, imagination, didn't feel completely satisfied with that, but finally found that actually the structural approach that you can bring to screenwriting and the imaginative side of that and the communal side of that all as a piece will take you forward to the next step. So, so that's my life story in a way, you know, so mm -hmm. going from practical uh, sort of left brain scientific thinking through completely right brain imaginative thinking, run off and join the circus, and then finally discovering that this is a job, it's got a real point to it. It requires both that side of your brain and this side of your brain. And that's how you become successful at it. I mean, that's a hero's journey. If I ever heard okay. one, John. <laughs> well, it was a complicated way of explaining to you that I think we all do, you know, you have to find a way of telling your story in a hopeful way. So it just doesn't seem like, like a bad screenplay or a bad novel. It's one thing after another, you know, so it's a whole lot of meaningless events strung together. Whereas we need in stories and we need in, in our lives to be psychologically healthy, a sense of, I think, meaningful forward progression. But you're so right about what people tell themselves and that's an ongoing process. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you're continually weaving a story. And I, I used to know the rate at which people 
talk to themselves. That is to say the rate at which we have a self conversation, but I don't know the number, but it's very high. So, and you're continually telling yourself something about yourself all the time. Lesson number four, this really resonates with me. Uh, find somebody who's done it before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my children are very reluctant to seek out mentors because you hmm. set out in life often thinking, if I'm any good, I need to do this myself, you know. But of course, um, if you find somebody uh, who's really good at that profession, you know, there's no way that you would become a carpenter trying to make bespoke furniture without going to see another carpenter and find out how you put a chair together, you know. So it seems like such an obvious lesson, but I think when you're young and, uh, and you think, oh, I've got to create my own individual way of doing things and I want to find my own individual voice, I think the main thing is to find how this thing is done that you want to do, you know, whether as in my wife's case is how do you become a journalist? In my case, first, how do you become a, uh, a novel or you become a filmmaker? You do it by speaking to somebody who's already down the track. And, and so I think seek those people out. They generally love being asked mm -hmm. how, how it's done. And they generally, as you and I are doing now, can kind of, with the benefit of hindsight, even though they were kind of, you know, we're all kind of burrowing through the undergrowth in the early days, but with the benefit of hindsight, of course, you know how it's done and you know the pitfalls to avoid, which is, I guess, the whole point of your um, podcast here. Well, it, I do a lot of career advising um, yeah. and um, uh, the way the reason this resonates many years ago, um, I, I run an executive search firm that's um, kind of high level recruitment. And years ago, a, a mentor of mine said, um, you ought to consider that stuff. that was working as a consultant psychologist at the time. He said, I think you'd be good at it. And I really respected him. But I said, but aren't they all wankers? <laughs> and, which may be upon reflection why he thought anyway, that aside. Oh, yeah. So what I did, and this is what I advise people, if you if you want to know about a career, contact people who are actually doing the job and ask them two questions, only two questions. That's all you have to ask. Those questions are, what do you like about your job? What do you dislike about your job? And then, then take notes. And then if you do that with enough people, you'll simply, you'll have a couple of lists and then it will make sense to you. It will, that's sure. the process by which I suggest to people that they clarify what yeah. happens. And, you know, I mean, I think many of us go into careers with some fantasy of what that career is, you know, or, or make life choices based on some kind of rather vague fantasy of what that would be like, you know. And, of course, you've got to go and see somebody, as say, who's experienced it, and they, and they can tell you, well, you know, working in an accident department is not quite like you see on television, you know, there's, you know, it's this and it's that, it's demanding, it's that, you know, yeah. Well, I can tell you in business, a lot of young guys, young people, they want to be the CEO. They want to sit in the corner office. I say, do you have any idea what a CEO does? And then I, and then I take notes what they say. Then I go and I tell the CEO and we both laugh because, you know, they're, <laughs> they're, they're clueless. I mean, for example, everybody outside Hollywood knows how much esteem writers are held in, um, in, in the media. Right? Right? <laughs> Yeah. I, you know, the other thing about like, oh, I want to be a writer because that's, you know, I, I formed that um, ambition quite young. I thought, oh, I'll become a doctor of adventures and I'll, then I'll write about them. And um, uh, yeah, that idea of a lone sort of gunslinger who wanders through the world observing life as Graham Greene or someone that mom did and writing it down, you discover very quickly that writing is not like that at all but actually we all we live in a society we we feed off the people around us that everything whether you every creative act is a is a kind of is a social act you know it's like it's uh, it uses the experience and the and the anecdotes of the people around you and actually it's not a it's not a matter of being the lone observer it's actually a matter of being absolutely engaged and involved with that stuff and so for instance you know that the idea of having kids to a young writer is completely terrifying. You go, oh my God, you know, I, you know, that'll distract me from my business of, you know, as the solo person wandering around the world, observing people and actually, no, you kind of, uh, I think I probably became a writer when I had children because you learn so much both about yourself and about society.
Mm -hmm. um, uh, lesson number five, locate your limits. Yeah, I must have been thinking about something about when, I, <laughs> when I wrote that. Line. Let me just check my own notes. You said about pushing your limits. <laughs> yeah, and, and limits, that's right. Take risks, you know, and challenge yourself. I mean, you actually never know what you're capable of until you do it. And I used to be kind of uh, nervous of, of public speaking and so started doing teaching screenwriting as a as an exercise and, and, and then would kind of be in a panic about, oh, how do I write down all the anecdotes I can think of and how do I order all this information? And then after you've done it a couple of times, you're doing it and it's like it just kind of flows and you're sort of, uh, you're happy in that space and then you have to find the next challenge. But I think so many of us live, you know, we are as a species attracted to comfort, you know, and to a greater or lesser extent, we all find a comfort zone and then dwell there. But I think it's important to keep on. Keep well, you, keep you on. sent me a note, which I, well, I want to repeat because I think it's so good. It said, if you never wish it weren't happening, it's not a proper adventure. It's not a, that's right. So just it's worth saying that again. If, it's never, if you never wish it wasn't happening, it's not a proper adventure. And this was told to me by a guy who was a young, around the world uh, yachtsman. And he, uh, he sailed around uh, the world when he was 17 years old. His mother, his single mother, Jesse, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot his name, but I'll need to give it to you later because we should include his name in this, in, uh, uh, Duff. Um, and so his single mother, um, in fact, let me just take, a, I'll start, can we just edit there? I'll just find his okay, name. Okay, yeah, fine, no problem. Tell you this anecdote yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, honoring him with the... Um, 17? 17, Seven. yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know where my mind was at 17, but thinking about circumnavigating the globe was not it. Uh, I'm just Googling him. Jesse Martin. Okay, let me start again. Okay. So uh, Jesse Martin uh, was a young, Jesse Martin was a young single-handed uh, yachtsman who came to me uh, to discuss writing the film of his uh, adventure with me. And uh, um, he discovered, he described to me how when he was 17, his, uh, his single mother mortgaged her house to buy him a yacht because he wanted to be a yachtsman. He learned wow. to sail, I think it was in uh, Melbourne uh, Harbour, from, a, from an old sea dog who had PTSD and was, it turned out, terrified of going beyond the mouth of the harbour, so taught him how to sail. And this was preparing Jesse for sailing around the world. And his mother took all sorts of plaque about allowing her son to head off on this extraordinary adventure which at which he succeeded he became the youngest guy to sail around the world single-handed and, and when i spoke to him about it afterwards i said look um jesse wasn't it just terrifying cold lonely and jesse said yeah uh, but uh, if it wasn't if you didn't wonder at some point why am i doing this it wouldn't be a proper adventure now that's really important to remember because so few of us push ourselves to that point, you know, and therefore you never, and an adventure is that it is, it is that it is a crisis, which draws on the best parts of you, you know, and, uh, and, um, uh, you know, you can say you've had an adventure by, you know, sort of traveling by coach to wherever, you know, uh, um, you know, we, we used to go camping in France as, as kids, you know, up and down France and staying in the south staying in tents that was an adventure but it wasn't really it wasn't really a proper adventure because we never really felt that we were being pushed to our mm -hmm. limits, you know and uh so yeah the, one of the principles in screenwriting is when you um i mean that you you take your characters on a journey that the journey becomes increasingly difficult that you know what they're after whether it's to get the girl or find the prize or da -da -da -da, but they but but the, the stakes become higher and higher, the mm -hmm. risk becomes mm -hmm. greater and greater. And one of the principles of screenwriting that is that as the risks and the jeopardy becomes greater, the character of the protagonist is more fully revealed, you know. And, uh, and through the hardship, through the testing, the, the crucible of the, the difficulties he, he or she is facing. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so both, as the, you know, if you apply that then to the narrative of your life, and we've all gone through bad periods where you go, why is this happening to me? Oh my God, you know, why, why me? Oh Lord. And, uh, and it's happening to you because um, 
in some way is going to make you better or stronger. Mm -hmm. And you need it. And a life without any pain or hardship or adversity uh, would not really be a proper life. So a funny way you should welcome those moments and recognize them for what they are as kind of, uh, here's where I prove my better self. The yeah. I, I, I know a guy who is a psychologist who worked with a numerous Olympic athletes and he's, yeah. he, he was, we were talking about um, emotional resilience, which yeah. is like, like a sponge. Everyone knows this, you know, a sponge, it yeah. resiles back to its previous shape. He said, but these guys that he works with, guys, male and female, yeah, yeah. A, a tough mindedness where you, you, you face the, 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 the challenge, the stress, the, whatever and you come back even better than before and i've seen this in special services um military people certain athletes it, they don't just come back to where they were before they're better than they better, were before yeah, because yeah. of the challenge yeah, yeah. and again going back to childhood you know or children we want you have to experience that stuff it's it's kind of um you know you need to know what it is Mm. And you need to know that you survive it, you know, tiredness, hunger, cold, you know, they're all things that we can and will get through. You know. mm. yeah. um, all right. Uh, proceeding to the next lesson, which we touched upon, humans achieve communally. Yeah, we did touch on that. And I think that's, again, uh, um, you know, we have these fantasies as a, as young men and women that we will sort of find our way in the world and excel and it'll be all our doing, but actually all of the successful filmmakers that I know are team builders, you know, or team players. And, um, and, uh, and as I said, even the most solo endeavor that you can think of, the kind of a novelist, um, is actually drawing inspiration from interacting with communities around him. He's not just, he or she is not just sort of sitting there and observing them. He, they're, they're involved in them emotionally and that emotion is what you then put on the page. Uh, so yeah, I think getting past the notion that I have to do this myself, I will get to the top of the tree, I'll become the CEO, whatever your um, kind of clients are trying to achieve. They need to get away from the idea that it's gonna happen individually and entirely because of their efforts. Because every film, say, that I've made, I've been part of, has been a team effort. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And often in really interesting ways, you, know, you start off with one set of skills and you, you work with documentary makers, with actors, with directors, with designers, and you create something that you couldn't have created on your own. Um, mm. So yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's true in business as well. I mean, uh, um, when you talk to people in business, there is no I, you know, it's always we because nothing happens without without a team. Or as they say in Hollywood, nothing is written, everything is rewritten. Yeah. And, and just uh, what you're saying reminds me, I have been in a, in a movie before. I was a featured extra in Superman Returns and my the single takeaway that I remember most vividly the just on a visual level was I felt as if I was marching in a creative army towards yeah. achieving something yeah, yeah, yeah. and and that's really pretty much all I remember about it and it's that's it's a great uh, feeling isn't it uh, yeah it is, it is it's fantastic yeah. Yeah. I recently got involved in a, a in a climate charity 350.org and, and that uh, that sense of having a common purpose, you know, there were so there are scientists, there are financiers, there are kind of um, uh, people who understand the psychology of motivating people to change their behavior. There are business people. And you do feel part of this cohort, as you say, that wonderful feeling of actually, we have a common goal. We know it's the right thing to do. Let's get there. And uh, it's wonderfully inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, I'll give you another a business example, you know, Silicon Valley, everyone thinks it's two guys working in a garage, discovering the next big thing like Hewlett Packard did. But in fact, Silicon Valley depends heavily, heavily on federal funding from the U.S. government, because otherwise, two guys in a garage wouldn't cut it, wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't, be, wouldn't be fast enough, wouldn't yeah. be a lot of guys in garages. But And um, the, the person who told me this was Jeff Bleich from California, former ambassador to Australia. Yeah. And, and, and it's, not, it's not promoted or it's not really known because the yeah. two guys in the garage is a bit more romantic, but, yeah. but 
it's having other people being able to attract investment, for example, you know. It's the garage, I have a mom and a dad who let them use the garage, they'll have kind of sisters who kind of give them that odd left field kind of idea that, oh yeah, we can do that. And you know, we'll have friends who'll drop in and you know. So there's that, you know, just welcome that. Um, I wrote a film about Charles Darwin, who, you know, went on the kind of, uh, this great journey, the voyage of the Beagle, when he was a relatively young man, came back home and lived in sort of the south of England for the rest of his life, processing all these ideas, you know, but, you know, there was a guy who grew from his colleagues, grew from his family, he kind of, from the village life around him, you know, that became as rich to him as life on board a ship, and it was like this community from whom he drew ideas and the origin of species, which was his masterwork, wasn't just about what he'd seen on the Beagle. It was about the, the pigeon fanciers and the horse breeders and the, you know, the observations of his own family. They all went into it. They all became part of the larger truth, you know. So um, he was he was a guy, you know, like a genius scientist who celebrated, uh, you know, as a genius in his own right. but he writes in that book, you know, this is all from my neighbors, it's from my friends, it's from my children, it's, you know, they all had a part in creating this. And he from thought about it 22 years before publishing it as well. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the, the thing, when I think about Darwin, the funny thing I always think about is his dad was very worried about him when he went to university because he was such a swell guy and thought all he would do is play cards and fritter his time away, which pretty much what he did, I think, until he, until he got a day job. <laughs> yeah, he's a dropout from Edinburgh, Edinburgh Medical School, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lesson number seven, output equals input. Yeah, and that's, this is part of the same thing, you know, that uh, you think of your, you, I mean, you might think of the job as a writer being sitting at a desk and, and having all these brilliant ideas, and, and young writers beat themselves up because they can't sit at the desk and have the brilliant ideas flow, you know, but... Uh, those ideas don't just generate themselves inside your head. They come from what you've read. They come from what you've experienced. They come from uh, who you talk to. So just as a creative exercise, even if I feel really uncertain or unsure of a story that I'm trying to write, I will tell it to as many people as I can who I trust. I'll, I'll just tell them the story and see what comes out and see what comes back at me from them. Uh, that reminds me of this or that reminds me of that you know so don't expect to just be able to sit at your desk and have the brilliant original thought you actually have to go out and excavate that stuff you have to go on the journey as Baz Luhrmann says you know, go have a analogous experience when I was um I was writing about ice climbing at one point um for a film about um it was actually touching the void not the documentary but I was writing mm -hmm. it for mm -hmm. Anna, and um uh, and so went ice climbing in Scotland to discover just the techniques of ice climbing. So then you can write about the kind of the, what your mind does when you're terrified, what your hands do when you're cold, what the, what the, uh, what the climbing equipment sounds like. So as it rattles around your waist, you know, uh, how your legs start to shake when you're kind of clinging to a rock face, just with your, you know, your crampons and your, and your ice axes. So all of that stuff then feeds into the story. It's not just sitting at your desk, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. imagining it. You've actually got to go out there and get it, you know. And a lot of, I think a lot of sort of superhero movies now seem to me just like sort of greatest hits from other films. There are people who've just sat watching movies and then, oh, right, yeah. this and a bit of that. And they're not, it doesn't actually have the feel as really great movies do of lived experience, you know. So yeah. and I think probably in the business world that brilliant ideas come from active engagement with the world, not just observing the world and thinking it can all happen on a screen in front of you. Well, yeah, and that's your point. They don't just come from nowhere. They, they, I, I'm, I'm, personally, I'd go a little further and say that we're swimming in a sea of ideas in, yeah, yeah. in, in, in co-it form. Sure. And um, the writer, Richard Lagrivenese, he the way he put it is that, um, I think I pronounced his name correctly, he wrote The Fisher King and, and yeah, other yeah. movies. And the Bridge of Madison County, a bunch of other, yeah. He said, there's always a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 you know, it, it's true. I, I find that if you, if you work at it long enough, you'll probably find a better idea. But if you're the CEO sitting in your corner office, you know, the way to get that great idea is to go down and hang out the factory floor and get your hands dirty and get in there and engage, you know, don't you think? I mean, in the business world, I don't know anything about the business world, but I imagine 
that uh, there's only so much you can do discussing things in the abstract around the board table. You've actually got to get down there and, you know, experience what it's like. Yeah, well, you know a lot about business because you're in it. It's just a different aspect of business. But if you know, it's the same people, <laughs> just you're just in a different environment. Um, but yes, I mean, there, there's only so much planning you can do. And in the business world, as I always like to say, I mean, you only have 80% of the available information anyway, so you have to make a decision. You can't just wait around for to be to be correct. You know, it's it's the same. So you're continually doing, you might say, churning out rough drafts of business. Of course, yeah. And you certainly make mistakes. I mean, no doubt about that. Like any other any other enterprise. Yeah. Um, lesson number eight: the hard conversations are the important conversations. Yeah, that's very true. I'm kind of a terrible conflict avoider, and so I hate having these difficult conversations. But you get to a point in any project where you have to have the difficult conversation, you know, and uh, and this includes the project of your life, you know. And and we tend to put these off. And if you're a conflict avoider, as I am, then you will avoid ringing the bank manager or the lawyer or the kind of or the competitor or the whatever it is, you know. Because you really don't want to have that conversation, you've got to do it. And the quicker you do it away, the better, you know, like uh, just get that out of your head and into the real world. Get that, whatever it is, that confrontation, that argument, that that plain talking. You know, we do it in our marriages with like the, 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 these areas of conflict with our spouse that you kind of skirt around you never actually want to um, challenge it head on and then you finally get to the point where okay let's have this you know let's have this out and you do it and you discover that you know all the things you thought she was thinking are quite different from what you know she's actually thinking but that, that happens a lot doesn't it i mean uh, yeah um, I, hark, I hark back to the uh the stoic philosophers i'm a uh, read marcus aurelius and he said something the truth needs no defense and 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 yet it it is amazing why we shy away from it sometimes, yeah, yeah. and and so but, but the reality of the matter is psychologically when you have that hard conversation you usually find and and the solution is you have the hard conversation and let the chips fall where they may, just live with the repercussions whatever they may be just work through them. Yeah, you learn with age, don't you, that it's possible to have these difficult conversations without emotion that you can actually take emotion out of the equation if you really think hard about it and 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 just deal with the facts of what has happened you know so um uh and then it becomes a philosophical argument it becomes a stoical argument doesn't it in the in the best sense so you say look here is why i feel kind of marginalized i feel kind of like resentful i feel mm -hmm. you know you this is why these are the reasons and then there will be counter arguments. Well, you're feeling that because of this, but actually what happened was that. And and then you have to try and deal with that information in a grown up way. Uh, you know, it happens with you know, conversations with the kids, school teachers when they're young, you know, it happens with, you know, as I say, a lot of conversations in business where you'll avoid and avoid the hard conversation, but if you have it, you can learn a lot from it. And the real, the kind of the Zen, sort of uh, stage of that is learning to have those conversations without fear and and to as you say rely on the fact that the truth is completely emotionally neutral there is a truth of this situation which we might not end up agreeing with but we can get to that truth and we should regard this like i'm going to come into your office i'm going to have a really difficult conversation with you but we'll arrive at some version of the truth that we can both live with you and mentioned yeah you mentioned psychotherapy earlier. I used to run psychotherapy groups in Sydney psychiatric hospitals. And what, what you find is the truth emerges in the in-between. It's not the client and the counselor. It's not the, it's the conversation in between the interaction, the in-between bit. That's where, that's where it is. That's where the, the reality is. Very interesting. And you find that a lot in filmmaking conversations with actors, you know, this is a bad line. What did you mean by it? You go, well, I wanted it to say this. And well, if I wanted to say that, I would say this. Mm -hmm. And I'd look like this. And, I, you know, and okay, that's brilliant. That's kind of, it's like, you know, somewhere between their understanding of it, your understanding of it, here's the perfect understanding of it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, 
point number nine, choose your children wisely. Now this is a very, <laughs> this is a variation. My, my niece used to complain about her mother, my sister, and I said, you really should have chosen your family more carefully. You know, but, you know. I was really meaning, look, I, I, that's a kind of stupid um, life advice because um, you can't know everything about your partner. And of course, I mean, Debs and I, um, Really, uh, Deb, we were both in our, by the time we decided to find a life partner, we were both in our late thirties. And so when Deb got pregnant, which was kind of half intentional, half by accident. Doctors never like, plan their pregnancies. I've observed <laughs> this. I mean, <laughs> don't you people know how it works yet? <laughs> well, I think if you're commitment phobic, as I, was, I think they, they kind of like, the idea of having children, the very idea of it is like, is, my God, this is going to completely change my life. How could I kind of walk into that? You know, so, so it's kind of always has to happen by accident. I think probably Debs was the same. She had a wonderful kind of solo career going there. And, and so, um, so anyway, we have, our, we have Laurie. Um, and then we sort of, we formed a marriage around that. We're still married now, sort of 25 years later. So it's, uh, it was a great success, but, um, you know, looking, I mean, as you know, you know, a lot of marriages collapse and all mm. goes pear-shaped. And it just seems that it is such a massively important decision in your life. We were incredibly lucky in a way that uh, it all worked out okay. But um, I do think it's probably the most, um, the most important, the most consequential decision you will ever make and and it is kind of extraordinary how unthought out it is that i mean we left a huge amount of chance we knew nothing about each other we hadn't thought about will we live in britain will we live in australia um will you carry on working will i carry on working how's that going to yeah you know? um yeah well it it is not i mean uh... I don't have children, and it's clearly a, 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 a not a rational thing to do to have children, but you know, from what I can tell. But, 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 but you're right. I mean, it's and this will take us up to our, our t final and tenth point. It, it's it's life is more than logic. You, there are simply things you cannot control. Life is much more complex than that, and, and so you make a decision, and there's no guarantee of success. There never was. There never will be. Yeah. And yeah. so it goes back to the adventure that you were describing earlier. Oh, absolutely, you know, there's that, and and also accepting um, accepting the uh, the ups and downs of it all, accepting that the bad stuff is actually the good stuff. There's a psychologist you must know called Malcolm Gladwell, who has a whole theory built on the fact that the kind of the the uncomfortable and unpleasant things that happen to you are, are all for the good. That you can actually reconstruct the narrative of your life, going, well, I had this very difficult. Um, mother, father, sister, whatever. Um, but now, in retrospect, I can see that they formed me and they made me who I am. You know, and the same is certainly true of a marriage that you go through. Um, you know, all these ups and downs. The best marriage advice I ever got was from my Greek friend Yanni, who's who had been married for um, ten years by the time Debs and I had tied the knot. And he said, "Look, you will discover. You know, there are times when you want to kill her. There are times you love her again. You know, but just accept that you're on this kind of this." sign curve this wave you know and and that uh, as long as they kind of the average of all these experiences basically positive then you're on a winner you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and live through the the uh, the bad stuff accept it we're we're really bad in the west at just accepting that things can't be rosy and fun and great all the time you know we we just bought into this kind of idea that our, that we deserve a life of happiness, privilege, fulfillment, you know, that's not, I mean, in peasant communities, that is certainly not the case, you know. Mm. Um, uh, the, the old teaching was that life is hard and you just have to get by, you know, so we need a little bit more of that, I think, just acceptance of, of the fact that it can't always be perfect, and that sometimes the imperfect stuff is good. Mm. Vicissitudes is the word, is just the normal hardships that occur in life, regardless of who you are, or where you are. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Mm. Mm. sure. Which takes us to our 10th point. point. Yeah. And I, th I think you just illustrated this. It's not analytical or intuitive, it's both. both. Yeah. 
So that's, this applies to life decisions, business decisions, certainly to creative writing. Um, I find my approach to writing um, fiction now is uh, I do plan out the story, but then once you've got a plan for the story, you have to just kind of go, okay, here's my plan. This is my roadmap. I'm just going to riff on this like a jazz musician. You know, I'm, going to, I'm going to know the chord progression, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to write it really quickly and see what comes out. And then I'm going to go back to that kind of brain dump of material, analyze what's good and what's bad, work out my story again. Where does the story get lost? Where does it appear? What's different from the story that I wrote, from the story that I thought I was going to write? Summarize that, do that analytical side again, and then do another kind of rush at it and, and write down whatever comes into your head. And so to harness both in life, in storytelling, um, in decision making, to harness both your intuitive, rash, crazy, whatever happens kind of attitude to life and, and also to harness your analytical and to regard these elements of your thinking as being friends, as being, as being uh, mutually supportive, mm -hmm. not as separate ways of approaching the world. They're actually, they're vital. And, and it's vital that we have both of them. So, Neuroscience bears this out uh, because you cannot have good yeah. sound decision making without the emotional component to it. And in fact, yeah, it reminded yeah. me of something I, they asked a computer years ago. Would, would you rather, would the computer rather have a watch that was stopped or a watch that lost one second each hour? And the computer immediately said the watch that stopped because it was correct twice a day. Whereas the watch that lost one second every minute would be well, correct every 800 something thousand years. You know? So, um, you know, so life is more than logic. Just being rational all the time doesn't, doesn't. Uh, and that was the genius of Star Trek, wasn't it? The kind of that relationship between Spock and Captain Kirk is like, we, we all are both of these people, you know, we have our analytical side and our intuitive side and, and to embrace both of them is really, really important. And I think that's where, you know, most of us kind of uh, do our best work. Mm -hmm. um, we'll finish on that note, but I do want to ask you one thing that, that I've noticed. I was looking on your website, johncully.com. Um, it appears to me you have a, a feel for indigenous people or underdogs. You seem to write a lot about that. I, I know you have 19 um, um, uh, published screenplays, produced screenplays, but you have a heap of others that haven't made it to the screen yet, and I won't even talk about the TV scripts. Is is that correct that you have this? Uh... Well, look, I traveled a lot in the third world when I was um, a doctor, and um, it does strike me now that you know we arrived at this kind of um, you know peak of Western civilization where things are as controlled as they can be, whereas the people who really have conflict and struggle in their lives are. Uh, are people who live in the third world and, and we know that you know like all of the shocks that that happen to our world are felt far more vividly in the third world you know if you're a if you're a kind of penniless peasant in india or africa you know what climate change is going to have a far more life or death effect on you than most of the privileged western world and so really those um kind of indigenous communities is where drama really resides now a lot of the time you know we don't want to see stories about people whose lives are relatively comfortable uh so i'm interested yeah i'm really interested in the in the stories of people who are at the who are on the front line you know yeah. Well, what, what I like is that you're giving them voice in some of the screenplays that you do produced and unproduced and and um allowing them, uh, promoting them to be heard. And, and yeah. that's, that's a good thing, I think. Well, you mentioned Hotel Mumbai, which is uh, my most recent movie. And, uh, you know, we went into that thinking we were going to write about the residents of a, of a Western style hotel in India, you know, who were kind of victims of this terrible terrorist attack. And we very quickly uh, decided that the real heroes of this story were the hotel staff who protected all the guests, even mm -hmm. though were Kind of invisible most of the time as, as hotel staff are trained to be but then when the shit hit the fan they came to the rescue and uh and helped shepherd these people from safety often at risk of their own lives and so yeah you kind of um you have a you, you quickly get a feel writing fiction for like where does the real drama lie and often lies with the 
least privileged member of the team. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and we'll finish there on that note. You've been listening to the International Podcast, 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn. This episode is produced by Robert Hosry and is sponsored by the Professional Development Forum. PDF provides webinars, social media discussions, podcasts, parties, anything you want, everything you need. You can find it at professionaldevelopmentforum.org. Best of all, it's all free. Oh, by the way, listener, you can contact us, podcast at 10lessonslearned.com. We'd love to hear from you. Once again, John, thank you for appearing with us. Very much appreciated. Thank you.